Leonard Brody, welcome to the Eagles Talent Training Now program. Uh, so glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, what I really admire about you is that uh, although you speak, you're really out there working in the trenches, developing businesses, uh, uh, the internet media. Uh, you've said that this time we're living in is like no other. Um, can you talk about how? Sure. I mean, I think human history has always moved in very strict sort of chunks of technological and behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And so we all know about the ones that we learned in school from, you know, the Mesozoic era to right through the Industrial Revolution. Um, I think the difficult thing for a lot of people to grasp is the, the era that we're living in now, which is nameless, effectively, but, but arguably since the rise of the commercialized Internet. Mm -hmm. And we are probably experiencing more change, and not only just technological change, which is it's the easy part to sort of at a high level understand, right. but the change in human behavior in us as people has so fundamentally expedited in the last 10 years that it's almost impossible to point to any other moment in history where that's been the same. And I think also you're at this place and moment in time where we just don't know the outcomes yet. It's right. so early. This, this, this era doesn't have a name. Right. It doesn't even really have most of it. You know, it's easy to look backward in the rearview mirror. You've even said that we're like children in it, when it comes to the virtual world too, right? Well, I think one of the big changes that we're seeing is um, there's a lot of evidence now to back up that you and I, and frankly everybody on this planet, regardless of age, uh -huh. are effectively two personalities. And science fiction talked about this for years. You know, you had... You had many writers talking about how we carry, would have demons or personalities that would, <laughs> you know, sidecar to us that would share um, elements of ourselves that weren't available in the physical world. And right. I think that's exactly what happens. I really kind of think that children that are born in this age are kind of natural born citizens of, uh, of technology. Uh, how do you think that the kids of the future are really going to impact this world? Look, I, I think that they're impacting it now. I think that what we are going through is a virtual and complete rewrite of this planet. I mean, everything from how factory floors work to the cars we drive to the ways we communicate to the ways we govern ourselves are completely being rewritten. And Gen Ys and Millennials are now just getting into the beginnings of heading into managerial positions within large organizations. So there's no, there's no doubt you're seeing an incredible amount of change already. And we see the early signs of that in just the mere uh, size and type of workforce that's been developed, mm -hmm. but you can see it in the way you communicate with your children or the, or the people around you. So the, the change is already here. Entrepreneurs, what are some of the biggest challenges you think they face today, either for a, a startup business or, or someone who's growing? Yeah, I mean, entrepreneurs, um, to me, have two big challenges. One of them is systemic and one of them is a personal issue. Mm -hmm. On the systemic side, this is there's never been a greater time to be an entrepreneur. So historically, our parents' generation made upper middle class and middle class wealth in fundamentally two ways. Mm -hmm. They did it on the increase in value of their family home, right. and then they did it through the stock market. Those are really the two drivers outside of how somebody who worked really hard could right. make and retire, so to speak. Right. Well, now we know that retirement as a concept, in my mind, is fundamentally dead. It's flawed. Mm -hmm. No one in my generation or below even talks about it or thinks about <laughs> it or, right. or frankly cares. Yeah. Um, however, now you're in this position where most of these folks, when they were thinking about how they became wealthy, mm -hmm. those avenues are no longer available. The average home in North America will only index to inflation. And the market's going to be very tough over the next 30 years to provide significant returns. Right. So entrepreneurship, so you ask yourself, in Gen, Gen X and below, how does that generation generate wealth? And the answer is going to be through entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is it's much easier financially to be an entrepreneur, to get your feet wet than it ever was before. Okay. However, that means there's a lot more noise in the tank. Mm -hmm. And so the successful models become 
you got to be a lot better and your A game has to be a lot more significant than it was even a decade ago. And on the personal front, as an entrepreneur, the big hurdles that most entrepreneurs face is they do it for the wrong reasons. It's not good enough to go in because there's a problem. It's not good enough to go in because you have an interesting idea. Right. If your business is not mapped to your personal life goals, it will fail, which is, you know, how many kids do I want? How much time do I want to spend on an airplane? How much time do I want to spend with my family? Those are really serious issues that most people don't think through, and it's why most immigrant businesses in North America are much more successful percentage-wise. Do you think that uh, sometimes people try to skip steps to grow, or maybe they can grow too fast? Yeah, I think they do skip steps to grow, and I actually I encourage that. I think, you know... Hustling and and uh, uh, the workarounds are kind of important. You know, if mm -hmm. back in the day, every software company company that was trying to sell to a large company didn't BS a little bit about the number of clients, not you know, and developers they had, right. they would never get a client. How much does the term social media annoy you? <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's on the one hand, the rise of social media and the rise of the web as a publishing platform and a conversation platform is incredibly important to humanity. Right. It's just, it, is a, it is such a fundamental piece of who we're going to be going forward that incredible things will come out of it and already have. Right. So I am, my career is based on it. Right. I'm fascinated by I spend every minute of my day in it, frankly. The but you, you really care about the why of it, right? I do. The downside of social media for me is that I also think it brings out the worst in people. Mm -hmm. In a lot of respects, it brings out this horrible self-promotion where people are really broadcasting elements of themselves that probably shouldn't be broadcast. So, <laughs> right. But I do believe the why is what matters. Yeah. And, and, and the reason you care about this stuff is because we have never in human history been at a place where you have a fundamental broadcast channel that connected millions of people to millions of other people with virtually no cost, right. very little, if any, government regulation in between. Right. I mean, this is the freest. If you go back to a soldier in World War II mm -hmm. and said, why were, you, why were you doing this? Why were you fighting? The answer would always be freedom. Right. We're fighting for freedom. Well, arguably, we are today, socioeconomically, the freest generation ever. Mm -hmm. Now you add the informational layer and we are truly at a level of freedom that we've probably never seen before, which is both good and bad. Right. Well, with social media, it's kind of like being Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. So, um, so what are the burning issues that organizations have um, that you've noticed when, uh, uh, when you're asked to speak? Look, I think generally speaking, people are confused. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you walked outside your front door and talk to the average person on the street, regardless of what they did for a living, I think the pace of change, the pace of the rewrite that's going on right. is so fast that people are confused. Right. And I think are, people are often confused because they're not great students of history. you you got you to gotta take a look back at, at other eras and how human beings responded to these kinds of changes before to get a grounding as to why it matters now. I mean... Today, the average parent will sit and be panicked about their child sitting on a device all day. Well, right. in the Victorian era, people were panicked about the creation of the sofa. They were panicked about the creation of a coffee house because <laughs> right. the people were going to get work done and weren't going to be sitting out playing outside and were going to sit reading all day. Right. Now, you would die for your kids to sit inside and read all day. <laughs> so, I mean, I think people just have to sort of keep in perspective. But the challenge is... How do you provide some sort of navigation so people can understand where the market is moving and how it affects everything from HR to marketing? The big issue here is the behavioral change. Technology is nothing without behavior. Mm -hmm. And we've had lots of technology that nobody's ever adopted and nobody's spent one minute thinking about. Mm -hmm. The question where most of the confusion comes in is when I look across the aisle at the person I'm working with or my family or my kids, mm -hmm. these are not... They're not, they're not responding the way they used to respond. They're not spending the time that we used to respond. And my recruitment and my marketing and my governance is not getting the same angle or results that we used to get. So that unit of human behavior is the biggest fundamental confusion I think that's going to have to be fixed.
What are some uh, some of the startup businesses that most excite you right now, and and why? It's hard to it's hard to narrow that kind of stuff down to a category. I mean, I, I tend to spend most of my life in the digital side of the sure. consumer internet, sport, media, entertainment. Um, but the truth is, I'm most interested in companies that are um, really, really adept at understanding how things work today uh-huh. and working on complete rewrites. And often that involves the democratization of stuff that wasn't really available to people before. So mm-hmm. to give you an example, one of the companies that I think is, is an incredibly um, unique tool for, for the average person is Uber. Yeah. You know, Uber took what was normally available to the 1%, the black fleet car service, and made it available to everybody. Right. And you see a lot of those, a lot of those things that were restricted to large-scale buyers or corporate buyers or wealthy buyers are now being democratized and available to everybody, from art to certain kinds of travel mm-hmm. to corporate discounts. You know, you, you can see all of that get democratized, personal shoppers. We're investors um, in a company called Wantering, mm-hmm. whose job it is to be the shopper for the ninety, the, you know, the personal <laughs> shopper for the ninety-nine percent. Right. And those are meaningful. And then that's one side of the house. The other side of the house that's really interesting is the stuff that I think is hugely risky that guys like Elon Musk are doing, where you are reinventing the transportation business with companies like Tesla. Mm-hmm. And forcing the hand of big autos to understand the importance of electric uh, electric vehicles, right. and you know, Elon's other company, SpaceX, just launched the first private rocket in space. Right. What I'm most interested in that's coming down the pipe, mm-hmm. I think you are going to see huge rewrites of the way democracy works, mm-hmm. and I think it's going to be done in the hands of private citizens. Mm. And so, what's cool about this era is there is nothing sacred. Right. Everything is going to be rewritten, redone, smarter, faster, at the end of the day with, with rather than the elite in mind, it's going to be created and thought through with everybody in mind. Right. Well, one thing that I think might change is uh, like education. Uh, uh, you know, because of technology, I think is really you know, uh, you know, uh, twisting that around. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a change in that, although it may take a while. Um, I think it's happening now. I, I think with every, if you look at every disrupted industry or sector, mm-hmm. there are very clear patterns in how they work. So if you looked at directories like Yellow Pages, the news business, education, they go through cycles. And the first cycle is you know, the awakening of the fact that they're being disrupted. Right. Then they go through a moment where you see the tail of the drop of the traditional business, <laughs> right. and other models start to rise, and inevitably the, the death of the traditional model happens very quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think education is in the midst of, of this cycle where they, they know it's trouble. Right. They know they've got to change their models. They know it's a you know a service that's vital to not only humanity but but the people that are actually coming and, and wanting to get skill sets every day. Right. But they've got to change the way they think about it, the way these services are offered, how they're offered, to right. whom they're offered. And I think they're in the middle of it now. They're in the middle of the figuring it out period. Like they're well past the we know something's broken here. Right. So I think you're going to see big, big disruption in the education world. And you're going to see a lot more private public partnerships in education than you did yeah. before. Well, Leonard, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us on our Trending Now. And uh, it's really been a pleasure having you on as a guest. Thank you.